Welcome to Chapter 11 of my Top-Down Network Design Material. In this chapter, we're focusing on selecting technologies and devices for the enterprise networks. This is always a fun chapter, because basically we have to explain what types of devices and technologies that are appropriate for the business, essentially looking at why we can't use small business or home type equipment in the professional network. So we're looking at things like remote access. That could be both for end users and for client locations or client sites, maybe even VPN concentrators, depending on our setup, the different types of WAN technologies, the different types of routers and switches. So some of the selection criteria could be technical goals, budget, business requirements, and or if there's constraints, if there's bandwidth issues, there could be qu uh, quality of service type requirements, current layout of the network, how drastically we have to change the network, traffic flow, traffic load, and how the traffic actually disseminates within your network, things like that. Remote access technologies, when it, rum, rum, when it deals with remote WANs or WANs in that area, could be PPP, ISDNs, cable slash DSL type modems. I'm sorry, PPP in this list is just not fit quite right. ISDN, cable modems, DSLs, those are all internet type service providers. Point to point normally is not internet, it's more of a point to point type location. Not so much point to point being the internet. But yeah. PPP, also known as point to point protocol, used with synchronous and asynchronous dial up and ISDN, ISDN links. So it doesn't perform the connection, it works over the link. It's a way to do some type of VPN or technology. And what's really funny here is what authentication protocols it uses. If you really want to get down to it, PPP comes in two flavors, one that uses PAP and one that uses CHAP, but not even CHAP2 or the newer chats. It's, it's all dealing with the older CHAPs because this is all really all insecure. CHAP is better than PAP, but again, these are all fairly old technology and all vulnerable to exploits. PPP does come in a few layers. It comes in a network control protocol layer, a link control protocol, an encapsulation on a high-level data link control, and a physical layer. When you take some of the Cisco courses, you actually learn more about HDLC in normally the last class in your WAN technologies-based class for your CCNA. So that's kind of interesting. So what about multi-chasses, multi-chass, multi multi-chass, multi-link PPP. Basically you have multiple chassis that have multiple links using PPP and that could be to connect to both an, a digital and analog network. So there is a way to stack these so it does it. How does CHAP work in this regard? We have a connect, a challenge, a hashed response, and a accept or deny response. But this is, again, a basic CHAP handshake, and most of this is sent via plain text. So CHAP has some benefit, but again, a big part of that is insecure. All right, moving on to ISDNs. ISDN is the Digital Data Transport Service offered normally by telephone companies. This is fairly old technology. Uh, I've seen it maybe once or twice. But again, they're normally used as a backup link, not so much a primary connection. Uh, like 56K modems. This is all old, not so much dead technology, but definitely dying. So the important part with ISDN is actually understanding the basic rate interface and the primary rate interface, BRI and PRI. Because again, depending on how we do this, you have to understand the different channels. For example, a typical B channel is 64 kilobits, and a typical D, D as in delta, channel is 16 kilobits. So, got to be careful with how we're doing this. So you'll notice you know, at the primary rate, the D channel is 64 kilobits. That's because it's really for 
bonded together D channels. ISDN components we have normally a ISDN non device like a phone or a computer. Then we have to have some circuitry that will allow us to connect. Very similar, we have a ca uh, going on to the broadband type technology like broadband, like coax cable. Very similar to ISDN, but way faster. Uh, they have a DOCSIS cable standard, which is Data Over Cable Service Interface Specification, DOCSIS. And depending on your provider, your internet can be anywhere between 2 or 3 megs up to a gigabit. Uh, in my area, they actually offer 4, or I think, sorry, 350 megabits per second over data lines uh, using traditional uh, coax lines. So cable modem service does vary depending on your service provider and your area and maybe things like the age of the cable and all of that good stuff. Next is DSL. DSL is going to range from similar speeds to broadband or cable. This says between 1.5 and 9 megabits. That's no longer valid. We have a very high or VHADLS, a very high I can't remember what the acronym stands for, but I mean it's a faster connection. For, it's still a DSL, but it's an asynchronous type of DSL that does higher frequencies for faster speeds. But DSL tra uh, travels over traditional phone lines, where broadband goes over typical coax. Other WAN technologies could be things like leased lines, fiber, frame relay, or ATM. In reality, frame relay and ATM are probably being replaced by things like MPLS and VPLS because those are newer technologies that are more common. Same thing with like Metro Ethernet. And that will probably be replacing things like ATM. Sorry, have replaced things like ATM. You can still find these, but they're a lot rarer. Lease line is a dedicated digital copper connection, similar to like a T1 line, and it's dedicated to you. Here's the hierarchy, the dedicated lines, and the appropriate connections. Each D line is supposed to be 64 kilobits, sorry, each DS line is supposed to be 64 kilobits, and you can actually go down and count how many DS lines there are and depending on how many DS, li uh, DS lines there are, you can figure out the appropriate capacity. Like a DS1 is 24 DS0 lines, which is that's also known as a T1 line, and you get 1.54 megabits per second out of that. We have these are not, uh, synchronous optical networks, fiber, and again, this is gain uh, gaining a lot more popularity and we have typical sonnet type ratings again we have an OC1, OC3 and you're going to notice again ev all of these are going to be based off an OC1 like an OC3 is supposed to be three times faster than an OC1 a OC12 is four times faster than the OC3 and so forth so typical sonnet is actually a ring topology and they're working in pairs. You could also call this an FDDI or a fiber distribution ring. That's those are still very common. We have frame relay that still exists for a little while, and that's going to be at, done at this uh, data link layer. And this is how to transport traffic across wide area virtual circuits. This is being replaced by MPLS and Metro Ethernet. The carriers agree to forward traffic at a committed information rate, or CIR. So basically, you guarantee X amount of speed based off of your service contract. Here's what the frame really looks like. We have a virtual switch network in the center. That's going to be your ISP. How they connect in between normally is not, we don't really normally care about. As long as it gets through their network and to our destination, that's what we care about. 
frame really does have a hub and spoke type interface. It could use sub interfaces. And the nice thing is you can actually have a centralized point. And you can have all of your end devices connect back to it. We have ATM or asynchronous transfer mode. This is used both for WANs and LANs. Copper based cabling, 45 megabits per second. If we're doing copper, it could be similar to an OC192. It could also be using wave division multiplexing. It does provide efficient sharing of bandwidth. It does have built in QoS. But again, this is a much older dying technology. This is being replaced by things like Metro Ethernet. Here, it's kind of important peak and minimum cell rates, cell loss ratios, and cell transfer delays are important. We don't have anything traveling over to uh, ATM that we call packets. We call them cells. You can put Ethernet over ATM, whether it's on the LAN or the WAN, so that is a possibility. You may require some type of converter to do so, but again, it's there. Go ahead and let's look at the selection criteria for our remote access. It could be the type of VPN features we have, type of VPN users we have, maybe things like what type of NAT we have and how it, how it functions, its reliability, its scalability, its availability, its budgetary needs, how easy is it to configure and manage. Can we take advantage of multiple uh, high-speed connections? Could we possibly do wireless? So lots of different options. Some of the other sec uh, crit selection criteria for VPNs could be things like tunneling protocols. Uh, IPsec and L2DP are common ones. Uh, honestly, IPsec is very common. Encryption algorithm. Are we using triple DES? Are we using RC4? Are we using AES? Normally, we're looking typically at AES, not triple deaths, but they're out there. What type of algorithm are we going to use for authentication? Normally it's going to be either an MD5 or a SHA-1. What other types of networking protocols can we tie them together? Can we do, uh, do authentication through RADIUS? So if you try to tunnel into the network, you may actually have to go to the RADIUS server to verify your credentials before you're given access. What type of routing protocol are we going to be using to allow traffic to be passed between you and the client or customer or whatever you're trying to VPN into. How are we getting certificates? Are we getting certificates? That's always something that may or may not happen. And how are we going to manage it? Is it going to be done through SSL? Is it going to be done through Telnet? Is it going to be done through HTTP or HTTPS? So there are different options. So we've got to keep that in mind. Other selection criteria could be the number of ports. This is going to be mainly for routers and switches, but ports, processing speed, mean time between failure, how quick it can process uh, data, how quickly it can process and then send out data. Are there other features? What media it, does it support? What does it cost? What are the bu uh, budgetary needs? Do they have some type of support contract available. One of the last ones is selecting a service provider. Normally I look at geographical area that they provide support for. Maybe things like reliability and performance characteristics, support staff, security and technical support. What do they offer? What happens if it's a new business or an old business? Does that come into play? What about the likelihood that the business will stay in business? What about how willing they are to work with you or work on new technology? What about physical layout? Physical adding of new connections or adding new lines or looking at what they're, uh, what they're relying on, what we're li relying on. What about subscription? Uh, are they subscribing to our network? Are we paying based off of resources? Things of that nature. So that was actually the end of this chapter. There's a lot of information here. 
And it's, again, this is more of just a brief overview, but there it exists. I'm going to leave you with some review questions. Compare and contrast technologies for supporting remote users, i.e., what are some different types of VPN technologies, and compare them, contrast them. Compare and contrast some WAN technologies like PPP, Frame Relay, ATM, MPLS, VPLS, things of that nature. Look at what selection criteria can be used when purchasing devices and what criteria can you use when selecting WAN providers. That's actually it for this chapter and I want to thank you. Chapter 8, Developing Network Strategies. This is always a fun chapter. So our author had a 12-step program. First, identify network assets. Analyze the security risks to those assets. Analyze security requirements and trade-offs. Big part of section three is every security requirement will have trade-offs. How available versus how secure is always one of the trade-offs. Fourth, develop a security plan that is realistic. Once we have a security plan in place, we can start uh, thinking about defining individual security policies. Develop procedures for applying those security policies. Seven, develop a technical implementation strategy. This, just because we have a security policy and strategy doesn't mean that we're going to have the feature set to install uh, the technical components of that security program. For example, install firewall. Okay, that's pretty straightforward, but do we have the technical capacity or the technical knowledge in order to properly implement that firewall within our overall design? That's why step 11, or step 7 is there. Step 8, achieve. Buy-in from the users, the managers, technical staff, and all other stakeholders of the organization. You have to have everyone on board in order for these programs to be successful. Step nine, train users, managers, and technical staff in policies and procedures that we have developed. Step 10, implement the techno, uh, tech, uh, step 10, implement the technical strategy and security procedures. That can only really be done after buy-in and training. Step 11, Test the security and update if necessary, or if there's any problems that are found. Step 12, maintain security. I like to also think that maintain security is sometimes test and update as necessary as part of the regular maintenance. So, what are some network assets? Network assets could be any hardware, software application, data requirements, intellectual property, secrets, or even could be the company's reputation. All of those are components of a network asset or assets for an organization. So what do we mean by security risks? It could be as simple as hacked at network devices. What data can be intercepted? How can we analyze, altered, or deleted? Could there be something in place to prevent that? A great example that I've just ran into, at my day job, we've been talking about how to uh, implement ARPA poisoning and how simple it is to actually uh, do ARP poisoning. And so we know that those types of devices could be hacked. We've been looking at ways to mitigate that risk. For example, dynamic ARP inspection, DAI. However, we don't run the AI. Even though we've been able to show how easy it is to use ARP uh, poisoning, our network engineers viewed the risk of ARP poisoning is so low that we should not have to worry about it. Other security risks could be reconnaissance or other types of VOS or DDoS attacks. Also, could be man-in-the-middle attacks. 
because we already talked about data intercepted, analyzed, and altered. What about data integrity? Those are all good risk factors to think about. Risk trade-offs. Within any uh, form of security, we have trade-offs. The trade-offs between the security goals and other goals. For example, affordability. Let's make things super secure, but can we afford to? That's always a fun one. Usability. If we make it so tight, so secure, is it still usable? What about performance? Realistically, if we make our VoIP so secure, yet we're not able to make phone calls, does that defeat the purpose of that technology? Next, availability. Uh, that's pretty straightforward. We need to have our resources available, but if we make it too secure that nothing is available, we're not meeting our security goal. Lastly, manageability. That's pretty straightforward. So an example of a trade-off is that the security can reduce network redundancy. If all network traffic must go through an encrypted device, for example, we may have one firewall, and that becomes a single point of failure. That defeats the purpose of being secure. Next, security plan. A security plan is normally a high-level document that proposes that an organization is going to do to meet specific security requirements. That could also include times, duties, people, and resources that may be required to develop the policies and how those policies will achieve the implementation of those policies. How could those policies and the implementation of those policies also meet the overall security goal or objective that our plan is supposed to be meeting. Security policy. Per a one of the RFCs, RFC 2196, a site security handbook is a security policy is a formal statement of the rules by which given access to an organization's technology and information assets must abide. But at the same time, we actually have to have a site security handbook, and most organizations don't. Most organizations have a written policy, for those that do, but they're not enforceable, or they're not enforced. So, a policy should address the access, accountability, authentication, privacy, and technologies, but should also talk about things like Enforcement. How are we going to enforce our policy? Us having a rule but never enforcing it? There's no good for that rule. Security mechanisms could be our AAA, authentication, authorization, accounting. Could also be physical access, for example, access control or magnetic locks or locking doors. Uh, locking doors could also be technology assets like data encryption, filtering software, firewalls, IDSs slash IPSs. Those are all good ones. So, let's talk about encryption for a second. Since we already talked about our AAA, what about our CIA? Confidentiality, integrity, and availability. How do we know that our data is going to be encrypted? This could be a public and private key system or PKI system. We encrypt data between our hosts. That way, one has a private key, one has a public key, and that data is gonna be encrypted in transit. And you use the traded keys, the public keys, to decrypt the data. That's always a good way to verify that data being transmitted will not be able to be compromised. Thus, confirming the confidentiality of the message as well as the integrity of the message. So how do we modularize our security design? First, it has to be a multi-layer approach. You cannot have a single layer. So we built multi-layers into our security so that if one layer fails, 
There's another layer that you still have to penetrate. Built in suspender, uh, sup suspenders approach. Pretty much, you don't get caught with your pants down. You have plenty of layers to provide overall protection. Part of that modulizing our security design involves securing all the components. That means our our network connections, our public servers and uh, e-commerce services could be, are they part of the network? Are they part of the DMZ? Where, they, where do they belong? That talks about encrypting or securing our remote access and our VPNs. Anything that's getting into our network should be uh, monitored, should be secured. Also, what network services are required to run? If they don't work, are if they don't have to run, are they being ran? If they are key component to our network services, are they being secured appropriately? What about the servers? Are the servers being verified and secured? End users. Are user services being secured, both by technical support staff securing the services that our users may need? But what about our users as a service? Are our users being trained in the way of our security policy? One of the next big things is wireless. Is our wireless secure? So Cisco does have a Cisco safe security reference module that does address security in every modular of a modular network architecture. That way, using this older plan, you can actually secure each area. So, first one, securing internet connection. That could be physical security, that could include firewalls and packet filterings, AAA, authentication authorization availability, could also be uh, auditing of logs, well-defined uh, exit and entry points into the facility, into our network equipment, as well as are our routing and switching protocols secured. That's always a big one because many organizations fail to do that. Securing our public resources. For example, securing servers in a DMZ, running firewalls on the servers themselves, as well as a dedicated device, using reliable and up-to-date security or operating systems that are uh, up-to-date on their security patches. Security experts recommend that FTP services not run on the same server as web services. It just happens to be that FTP users have more opportunities for reading and possibly changing files than web users do. There are hacks out there that allow FTP users to escalate their privileges on a web server. So those are things to consider. Security topology, making sure we have the appropriate services as appropriate machines. Web, file, DNS, mail servers, are they all on one server or are they separated? Not so much virtual versus physical servers, but is there a virtual machine each one, for each one of these services? Is there a physical server? Should it be this type of flat file system? As opposed to this one. Our DMZ is tied off of our firewall. And that's its own little branch. It's just like the rest of our enterprise network. And even here, there may be a dual firewall put in place. So there could be a firewall in between the router and the internet. Then the router. Then another firewall between the DMZ and the internet. Cisco loves to put firewalls in very key areas. Next, securing our remote access. Again, that's physical security. As our protecting our firewalls, our VPN servers, other remote access devices, could be one-time tokens, could also be security protocols like CHAP or RADIUS or DACTUS. AAA is also brought up again here. 
physical security is going to be in a lot of these areas. But verifying that each area has the appropriate security measures to protect them. Securing network uh, services. Treat each network device as a high value host and harden it. Pay attention to which device you're using default passwords and get rid of them. How are you uh, securing connecting to those devices? Are you allowing Telnet? If not, are you allowing for secured SSH? Change the welcome banner to the appropriate less welcome banner, like authorized access only. Securing our server farms. Is there a firewall? Is there an IDS slash IPS monitoring the servers? Are the servers kept up to date? Are the accounts appropriate? Are there weak passwords on those servers? Those are all things to consider. What about securing user services? That could also include, include things like applications. Are the PCs uh, having a firewall ran on them? Are the antiviruses running and active and up to date? How are the antiviruses to begin with? Here we could also implement a written policy that specify how the software is installed as well as what software is installed. If we're worried about physical security on our user services, we could consider 802.1x port-based security on our switches. That way, port security could control port access to our individual devices. What about securing our wireless network? That could be as simple as setting the wireless on their own uh, VLAN or subnet, simplifying the address, making them different addresses, filtering, adding in a radius server for authentication of wireless users, require all wireless laptops to run personal firewalls, or uh, also include antiviruses. Both Windows, uh, Microsoft products, and Cisco have NAC network access control or NAP network access protection so that if a wireless device gets on the network and they'll verify the personal firewall and IP virus is up to date. If not, they get placed into an appropriate VLAN to reduce the risk of security. Not a lot of companies that I've ran into use NAC or NAP, but those are all uh, key things in wireless, securing wireless security. That could also be wireless security as in, what wireless uh, encryption are they running? Are they running WEP? Are they running WPA, WPA2? Is the WPA or WPA2 uh, personal or enterprise? Is radius tied here? That's all big other things. WEP is poor, but if that's what you have, it's better than nothing but it's pretty weak. You can Google how to break web encryption and break web encryption within a few WPA2 is a nice alternative. Normally it uses advanced encryption standard, AES, which is a 256-bit key. This is better. However, it's not as good as WPA2 and WPA it's already shown you could break into it 20-30 minutes. Part of this could also be including EAP, Intensive Authentication Protocols. That so we can couple our 802.1x with our EAP. This allows us to run things like RADIUS. Forcing our wireless clients to authenticate against our RADIUS server. That way, we could pass credentials from our wireless access, from our wireless users, to our wireless access control, to a server running our RADIUS server. That way, they could pass the credentials and verify if they're allowed on the network. 
if that's too protocol heavy, Cisco has a lightweight EAP that allows for mutual authentication. That way the user and the access point must be authenticated. That way you can verify that you're truly authenticating your wireless user against the appropriate Cisco device that is then authenticating against the appropriate RADIUS device. There are a plenty of other EAP types out there, but Cisco and Microsoft really push the leap and peep, the protected EAP, and all of that is encrypted traffic to the RADIUS server. We could also talk about software on our wireless clients. If we're already assuming that our wireless clients are secured, what about the VPN software on the wireless clients? Are they secure? Are we uh, verifying that passwords and credentials aren't being saved? That's part of the VPN security. And that's actually a key thing here. VPN security to verify that our mobile users are tunneling into our network so that they can securely transmit and receive sensitive data, or just data in general. That's actually it for chapter eight. So I, I hope you guys took here security plans, policies and procedures, and the different mechanisms for keeping them in place. I wanted to thank you and hope you guys have a great day. Okay, so I wanted to discuss some follow-up items. One of the first things is our APA formatting and citation. That goes for both our IPs and our discussions. Remember that we have to do all of our work according to the APA manual. So if you're not sure how to do that, go online. Uh, you can type in APA formatting. Uh, if you don't want to look it up online, you can go to any of the tutorial services. We have a writing, we have a library service. They can give you additional resources on how to do APA formatting. That's important. That's not going away. Uh, in discussions, same thing. We have to be doing our citations in our discussions because one of the big things is for our citations, we're building off of other people's works. So it's a way for us to verify what we're claiming is supported by the literature. So when I say something at the sky is blue, you can take my word for it. Or if I provide a citation, you can take an expert's word for it. And then I build off of that. So it just kind of increases your credibility we should be at least citing in every uh, post or as much as possible because again we're trying to link what we've done back to the literature same thing in our IPs every paragraph should be uh, tied to a source every paragraph is an idea and every idea we need to have support within the literature and I know at this level it's not that big of an issue but you want to get in the habit of doing that so when you start doing higher level work it's second nature also length we don't need posts that are great job I mean don't get me wrong it does add to it but when I start grading for posts I'm not doing uh, full credit for those that have three posts and two of them are great jobs I don't count the great jobs as a post. For our discussion board, I'm looking for three solid responses with citations. Uh, for our papers, I'm looking for three pages of content with citations. So what I mean by content is that's three papers on topic. That's not a cover page, that's not your reference page, that's three content pages. Uh, two if you're really good, but I'm really looking for three. 
if you're doing uh, diagrams. Diagrams totally are okay as long as you're doing them within APA formatting. Lastly, grading. Again, I grade off of heavily off of attempt, like if you're putting an effort into it. Like if you did two pages and you did a few citations and I could see that you were making an effort, I'll, I'll meet you. But if you post once or you did a page and a half with one citation, you know, that really isn't you making an effort. Uh, if you get stuck, don't get me wrong, some people a page is a lot. If you get stuck, you have plenty of resources to bolster up your paper. You can contact me, I'll help you. If you don't want to contact me, we have a writing uh, center, we have a tutorial, uh, tutorial center, we have plenty of help for you to get. If you need tutoring, there's a lot of tutoring out there. And uh, again, provided from the school. All you have to do is say something. For our tutorial lab, we have tutor uh, tutorial services for SQL, we have tutorial services for database, we have tutorial services for math, English, writing, research, library services. I mean, we have a great amount of tutorial services. And if we don't offer tutoring in a specific area, you can ask for it specifically, and they will find tutors for you. So you cannot use, you cannot get tutoring, because you can. If you ask for help, the school will get it. If you cannot get it from the school, there's other help. I will sit down with you. I will do as much as as much as I can with you. If you need one on one. If you need tutoring and you don't get tutoring, that's not a failure on my part. That's not a failure on the school's part. That's only a failure on your part because there's plenty of opportunities there. You have my number. You have my email. You have two emails from me. You have my cell phone number. You have plenty of ways to get a hold of me if you need help. And again, if you don't capitalize on help and you need help, that's on you. That's on you. Okay, there's plenty of help out there. All you have to do is say something. Thank you.